preacher came one Sunday and he preached for 15 minutes. He came next Sunday and he preached for 30 minutes. And he came the third Sunday and he preached for two straight hours. And the deacons got a hold of him and said, well, what in the, what in the world do you have such variation in your sermon? He said, well, he said, the first one I had 15 minutes, I just had my teeth pulled and the gums were sore. I said, well, what about a 30 minute one? Well, he said, uh, uh, they just fitted my dentures and I couldn't keep them in. Said, well, what in the world happened to two hours? Said, I picked up my wife's teeth by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> we hope that don't happen. You know. <laughs> but anyway, if you have your Bibles and follow along here, and since our time is going to be a little short, we're not going to get uh, near through all of this. But what you need to do when we start it on this again, I want you to be sure and bring this, and we'll announce it before we start off. It'll probably even be toward the first of the year because we have Thanksgiving this week. And our next Sunday, we're going to bring a message on that. Then we'll start on Christmas messages. So it'll probably be the first of the year, and we'll start back on the Bible prophecy and so forth like this. So we'll get as far as we can go here today on this here. And the thing uh, uh, that people wonder, we have a monodidic job that says uh, we're going to annihilate Israel. Well, the, the things there, uh, you're going to be annihilated. Uh, you're not going to annihilate God's chosen people. So uh, you people don't have to worry about that. It isn't going to happen. Israel is going to be Israel until clear out in the end and clear on through the millennium here. So it's not going to be annihilated by any little punk kid there about five foot six or something there at 125 pounds that's going to annihilate Israel. You little punk. And I don't know why somebody can't stand up to him or even our leaders and tell him, go blow your nose in somebody else's lap hard because you are nothing. And I'll tell you what, in fact, I wish somebody would do that to the president, don't you? You know, if you want the truth, you know, run around all over the place and everything else, and we're about bankrupt in America, which we are, and now we're going to do away and really cut down on Medicaid and Medicare and so forth like that, and all of that funding there. Why don't you quit sending money to these countries that hate America, you stupid people? What are you thinking about? You're sending money all over the world to all these countries and so forth and, uh, and uh, Libya and to help rebuild. Libya is going to be with Russia. Libya is going to be one of her allies. So just because uh, Gaddafi is out of there, don't think that it's going to be an ally of America because it's not going to be. And how do you know that? Because the creator of this universe put it in the Bible and told exactly when it's going to be destroyed. And that's what we're going to look at in our Bible. So we hope that if you've got your Bibles there, if you want to follow along here in our uh, uh, outline here, uh, we'll go to Ezekiel chapter 38, because Ezekiel 38 and 39 have to deal with the end times for Russia and Libya and Tagarma, which is Turkey, Goma, which is Germany, Ethiopia, and so forth. Five allies of Russia that are her allies today, and you see it, all of this developed, it's right in front of your eyes, and God wrote this back here hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. We'll say it's been 2,000 years since Christ, and it's been another 700 years when Ezekiel wrote it, in round numbers now. So we got 2,700 years that God tells you about Russia that never existed then, and when it's going to exist, who its allies are going to be, and when it's going to be destroyed. It's going to be very interesting to you. And God put that in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38 and 39. If you read in chapter 36 and 37, it talks about bringing Israel back after the diaspora, after they were scattered to the four corners of the earth. In the latter days, God will bring them back under a one head, and it talks about that in those two chapters, leading up to when their enemy, which is Russia and the five allies, are going down to destroy them on horseback. It's very interesting. God puts that kind of uh, uh, information in there for you and I to know, because he pre-wrote the history. 
You wouldn't know anything about hell if God didn't put it in the Bible. You wouldn't know anything about the lake of fire if God didn't put it in the Bible. You wouldn't know anything about the bottomless pit if God didn't put it in the Bible. You wouldn't even know anything about Hades, where the lost go today, would you? If God didn't put it in the Bible. Has any ever been out into eternity? Has any human being ever been into eternity and come back again? Give me a break. None. So the only thing that we have outside of human philosophy is the inerrant word of God because all scripture is given by the inspiration of, of God. Isn't that wonderful? So I can go to the Bible and find out. I don't care what any philosopher tells me or what his ideas are. Really, I just throw them in the garbage can because if I want to know something, I just go to the Bible and find out what's going to happen. Isn't that the thing? Then I have the truth. I don't have some idiot's philosophy or he thinks this or she thinks that. Who in the world cares what you think? But I do care where I'm going to go when I die. And God put it in that he loved the world, he loved me, he loved you, he loved every human being that he is responsible for creating. And he said, I'll send my only begotten son to come down here because if you want to pay for your sin yourself, you'll do it in the lake of fire. Depart from me, you're cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So anything religion concocts up like you got to be baptized, you got to walk an aisle, you got to do this, you got to do that. And one thing or another, throw it away because you're not saved by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy as he saved us. Amen? So you're only going to heaven one way. Christ said, John 14, 6, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Period. That's it. So if I want to know the truth, and I do, because I'm either going to heaven or hell. Right? Absolutely. So now I wonder, when I look in the Bible, what about the United States of America? What's going to happen to this great, wonderful nation that was founded on the Word of God, Christian men, basically, and the principles that God wanted the nation to establish so that he could bless that nation, and he has blessed the United States of America. And through some idiots, we've been in wars we shouldn't have been in. We went in there, and we go to Korea, and we go to Vietnam, and then, and we're stupid enough where we lost 50,000 men. You don't send troops into a jungle when you don't even know the jungle on somebody else's territory where they've lived for years and know it inside and out, and you send me in there? I'll tell you what, I'm not going in. Now, I'll tell you what, I'll stay on the outside edges of it, with a steel thing in front of me, armor, uh, piercing armor on, and I'll just start shooting. Why don't you fly a plane over and start bombing them all? Why are you sending troops in for? Now we're doing the same thing down in Afghanistan, and so forth like that. So through the stupidity of some of our leaders, we can take care of some of these things here and not lose a third of the men that we're, we've lost. But we don't have leaders anymore. And they allow this little president to run around, do whatever he wants to do. And Mr. Congressman and Mr. Uh, uh, Senators, what do you guys do? Standing around the corner somewhere and saying, bye, President, bye, 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 bye. Go where you want to go. Go where you want to go. You've got troubles at home. Stay home and get your troubles straightened out here. You know, quit sending our money over to all these countries here. I don't want to see the Medicaid and the Medicare go by the wayside, and the Republicans want to do the same thing. And then they're going to cut our defenses drastically. Clinton did the same thing, and luckily we didn't get attacked. But now, Obama's going to do the same thing, and if you didn't know this, I'm going to throw this out because this has to do with America. The United States of America that I love. Obama would love to see this country go under. Why would that be? Well, first of all is this. If he was for America, you wouldn't bow down to these foreign leaders and tell them how bad we have treated you and all this kind of garbage. When he got back, they ought to be lined up with the whole Congress and Senate and said, buddy, you ever go out and do that again, we're going to file impeachment against you. This is America, you're our president, you're acting like some traitor. You know? So that, that's what should have been done if we are a God-fearing and we love America. But as long as America can go under, and I don't see a reason he didn't want to see that because he's doing everything to do it, including our 
defenses down on the border patrol and so forth like that, you, you file a law against the state that wants to enforce a law that you should enforce yourself. And every, everything you do, sir, is destroying America. The things you've loaned the billions of dollars to, they're now bankrupt. So evidently, your judgment isn't too good. So then when it comes to that, and America comes to where it is just where you can't make it, we can declare martial law. And therefore, the president doing what he has orchestrated to do to America, martial law means he'll tell you where you can go and where you can't go and exactly what's going to be. And you have no vote, you have no say-so, and you've got a communistic country. Socialism, fascism, and so forth. That's what you got. That's what the man wants. It's exactly what he wants, or you would stand up for America. You wouldn't let anybody speak against this great country here if you were proud of the country. But the church you went to for 20 years or so was nothing but a white supremacist. I mean, he was a hate of the white people. That's where you went to church, and once in a while, if you're pinned down, you will say, well, well, well I'm Christian. Really? Well, you, <laughs> what a joke. What happens to America? Well, America is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Nowhere. And we'll get into some that try to say it's the young lions that spoke about and so forth there because of, of uh, England and so forth like that. We'll show you how that's not true. But nowhere, if we went to war with Russia and Russia said, if we go and invade Iran or bomb Iran, we've declared nuclear war. So, we're very in a very tough position because we don't want war with Russia and I pray that we never do because she will win. Why will she win? Because number one, she's not going to be destroyed until after the rapture. And that's what we have given out here to you to show you these things here. And we get on that. The United States is not mentioned anywhere. And when you kill babies and you saturate your <coughs> land with homosexuals, and you take away where you can't even carry a Bible to school without somebody saying, you can't name the name of Jesus Christ when you pray at a meeting and so forth like that. We've done everything to strip this great country of God and Christ, you see. So we're right at the point to where it's a miracle that we haven't had something happen to where we lose our freedom, just like the ten northern tribes did of Israel. Israel. The two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, they didn't learn a lesson by seeing their relatives all taken into captivity by Assyria in 721 B.C., and then God gave them a little time. Well, can't, can't you see what happened to uh, your ten tribes of your nation? Can't you see what happened to them? You're only two tribes left. Well, didn't learn a lesson at all. They got their corrupt leaders, except for uh, Josiah. And boy, he cleaned house. He got, rid of the, uh, he got rid of the homos, and he got rid of the sacrificing your children to Moloch, and so forth like that. We had one good leader. <laughs> And boy, he stood up and he cleaned house. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a president that said, you're not killing any more babies? Wouldn't it be wonderful if he got up and said, you know what, we're taking care of our elderly people. We're not cutting anything on, on the welfare and so forth. And if we cut anything, cut giving our money away to these communist countries that are all lined up. But let's give you a few of them here, okay? So you can understand and be praying, even so come Lord Jesus, because there's no way out, folks. Not with the leaders we got. We're lucky to have the freedom that we have, and if it comes down to where we get worse and worse, uh, don't, don't look for everything Obama's done has destroyed America. <laughs> sure, this, is, this isn't the America I grew up in. And then when he comes along and says, well, now we're going to have martial law, uh, brother, that's a God-given right to control you and tell you exactly what you are supposed to do and you better obey or you're going to go to prison. That's what martial law is, folks, you see. So you're not sitting on a, uh, <laughs> your United States of America uh, has had it, if you want the truth. 
You say, well, and I agree. I've got to agree with our president. He said America is not a Christian nation. You're absolutely right, sir. It isn't. America is not a Christian nation. You people are Christians. But you go out here and you go out and you witness to people. Witness to a Lutheran and ask them how they're going to heaven when they die. Witness to a Jehovah's Witness and say how are you going to heaven when you die. Get a Christian science and say how are you going to heaven when you die. And then you have all of these cult religions up and you tell me this is a Christian nation? Give me a break. You got a handful of Christians in the United States of America, and I'm just using that as an illustration here. Of course, there's more than a handful, but compared to the total populace, it's just a handful. When you ask them how you going to heaven when you die, most of them won't even talk to you. And the ones that do talk to you, well, well, it's because I'm good or I've been in this church for years and all that kind of stuff there. Is that a Christian? That's not a Christian. That's a religious person lost on their way to hell by their self-righteousness. That's what it is, folks. You're going to heaven because you realize you're not good enough to go to heaven, but God loved you so much, he paid for your sins so you don't have to go to hell and do it yourself. Aren't you thankful you're saved? Amen. And the rapture could happen tomorrow. There isn't anything to keep it from happening. Everything in Bible prophecy has been fulfilled. Okay, let's start down here. What about Russia and her allies, all right? <clears throat> here we go. We go over here to Ezekiel chapter 38 and verses 1 to 3. Over there, here's what the Word of God says. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Prophesy against him. All right. Then he says, And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. That's how Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 1 to 3 do. Now, what about Gog and Magog? Now, we'll go here and just give you the highlights of this here, and there's a lot of other stuff in here that you can read. That's why we printed it out, so you can take it home and study it, and therefore. But in verses 1 to 3, Gog is the leader. Magog is the whole area or the whole land there. And uh, you'll find out that almost all Bible scholars that know anything at all uh, have come to the same conclusion. It's speaking of Russia, and one of the reasons is... And if you go to verse 15 of the same chapter, you'll find out, and this is on your next page, just follow along. Thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company, and a mighty army. Well, there's two things. We'll get to the horses later as we get on down and show you why. Some say that they are airplanes and so forth. No, they're horses. They're horses. Well, we didn't have airplanes then. Well, that's true. But God knows they're horses. So, he would have used something else. But, anyway, the thing we're interested in, they're coming out of the north parts. Do you know Ezekiel, also in Ezekiel 39.2, we're told again that this nation comes from the north. Now, that identifies also who Gog and Magog are, okay? And notice what it says. And I'll cause thee to come up from the north parts, and I will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. Now, if you get... And in Bible prophecy, you will find Jerusalem is the center of the world, <laughs> biblically speaking. So when it uses north, south, east, and west in Bible prophecy, it's always from Jerusalem. That's the center of the world, biblically. So, if you look on you, how do any of you have a globe at home? You know, it gives all the countries and everything. Any of you got that? You know, and you're spinning around. <laughs> Nobody? Nobody got one? Okay, we got one, two, three. Okay, great. Well, if you look on that, you will find that Moscow is directly north of Jerusalem. So God gives you where this country is located. And as we're going to see, we'll give the two chief cities here, which are Moscow, or Meshach and Tubal, Moscow and Tobolsk, one in the eastern uh, capital and uh, uh, the other in the western. Okay, come out of the north. Now, when in connection with Israel, which is the center of the world, biblically speaking, north, south, east, and west is always in relation with Israel. Its capital is Jerusalem. You ought to look on your map or on your globe there, right north, and just draw a line there, just get you uh, 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 something, and put it on Moscow, pull it down to Jerusalem, and you'll find out it's right straight north. So God puts it down there. Now, another thing, 
Our Bible encyclopedia concerning Gog and Magog says that they are the furthest northern nations dwelling in the regions of the Caucasus Mountains and the Volga River in Russia. So, Bishop Lauer, clear back in 1710 of England, you find out that he wrote Rosh, R-O-S-H, taken as a proper name signifies the inhabitants of Cynthia, from whom the Russians derived their name. Very interesting. Then we come on down, the Jewish historian, and uh, some of you may have the book by Phileas Josephus. He was one of the great Jewish historians. In book one, chapter six says, the Scythians were called Magog. And our history books tell us the Scythians settled in Russia. Where's that? Now, if you look in verse two, and this happens and it was a mistranslation. In verse 2, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Look at the word chief. The chief here, the word chief here, is the Hebrew Rosh, R-O-S-H. It's a Swedish name for Russia, Rosh. Now, what they did, they took it as an adjective instead of a noun. So, they put the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. That's translating it as it appears in your King James Bible there as a adjective, meaning chief. Instead of a noun, therefore, it would be the proper name of a northern nation, that being Russia, therefore the proper translation would be as follows. The prince of Rosh, Russia, Meshach, and Tubal. Now, we might also note that Rosh is also, as we've said, the Swedish name for Russia. Meshek would be none other than Moscow, representing the West. Tubo, present-day Tobolsk, one of the chief cities in Siberia, representing the East. It has a population of a little over 104,000 and houses a major oil refinery there. <coughs> well, this is Russia we're talking about. And then the Lord's going to tell when it's going to, when it's going to go. Who ever heard of Russia 2,000 years ago? She was non-existent. Only the Lord can name a nation some 2,000 years before, uh, before it ever existed, or we should say about that, and state exactly when it will be destroyed. The history book of the future is given to mankind to know what's coming next and how gracious, really, the Lord is uh, in order to do that, you know. Now, if we go on over, we begin to find that uh, we come to Russia's allies that are identified in Ezekiel, but also when the Lord tells us in Isaiah 42, 9, he says this, he says, Behold, the former things have come to pass, new things do I declare, but before they spring forth, I'm going to tell you of them. I think this is pretty good to tell us of a nation like Russia, named five of her allies, and this was stated clear back, 2,700 years from where we are now. I'm just glad that God gave us the Bible so I don't have to listen to a bunch of ideologies of men, a bunch of philosophy, and I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen to America. I know what's going to happen to uh, Israel. Nobody's going to destroy her. I'm in a job, a little punk kid in a man's suit, and say she's going to destroy Israel. <laughs> God's chosen people, mister, I'll tell you what, Satan signed your death warden for you, and that's who you're following and who you're believing and so forth. You're as good as dead. Amen, John. Really. Okay, Russia's allies identified in Ezekiel chapter 38 in verses 5 and 6. Persia is the first one. Persia is a country whose name now is Iran. It was changed in 1935. Her name was changed to Iran. Persia is prophesied to be allied with Russia in the latter years in verse 8. And the latter days is stated in verse 16. Since this invasion will not occur until after the rapture, yet we see evidence now of Russia applying aid and weapons to Persia or Iran. They're together now. How close the rapture really must be. This alignment did not just start. It was formulated many years ago. And you'll find that Iran or Persia has always been in alliance with Russia. 
Forget what the newspapers say. She's always been a lion to it. Do you remember some years back, and uh, they were talking about Russia and how that she was looking like a free country now and so forth like that and one thing or another and really wasn't communistic. We said on the radio at that time, people will be deceived by that. Russia is Russia. She's communistic. She's a totalitarian uh, nation. She's a dictatorship. She hates America. She wants to rule the world. And she hates Israel. And don't buy this bunch of philosophy coming out because she's giving in here and we're giving in there and we have an American on the Sputnik and so forth like that and all that. that that's all. Don't buy it. It doesn't represent Russia. Russia is going to be destroyed because she is a God-hater and she wants nothing to do with the United States of America unless any agreement would be to her benefit, you see. And that's what all these nations are that deal with America. It is to get our money, isn't it? Really? Don't we do it? You, you don't buy somebody's allegiance at all. You just don't buy it. The alignment did not just start. It was being formulated many years ago, as far back as 1932. Moscow signed a treaty with Russia. And that treaty was that should there be a war, Russia was promised free access through Persia to the Middle East and to Palestine. Three years after that, in 1935, her name was changed to Iran. Remember her leader, uh, Manadinejad, has vowed that they would exterminate Israel come Completely. Isn't that something? It's an amazing what men think they can do. Next we come to, well, what is the next nation that's going to be? That's Ethiopia. That's Ethiopia. Go over there on page 138. The Hebrew for Ethiopia is always Cush. In the past, Haile Selassie, who claimed to be a Christian and could very well have been. He was a friend of the United States. And, uh, uh, was a real friend of us. I mean, we, we were excited over having him. He had a lot of meetings with him, but it wouldn't last. There was a revolution that took place. The initiation of the 1974 revolution was the work of the military acting essentially as its own immediate interest. And then the unrest that began in January that year spread to the civilian population in an outburst of general disorder and so forth. To make a long story short, the government took over. Haile Selassie was recent, not recently here now, but shortly after that, he was found in his palace, strangled to death. After that came on a totalitarian regime and so forth. Clear on down, they killed thousands upon thousands and thousands. They formed what was called a DERG, D-E-R-G, <coughs> And that is a committee that seized power from the emperor and installed a government which was socialistic in name and military in style, which is, very simply, totalitarianism. Lieutenant Colonel Mengista Ali Morayam assumed power as head of the state and the DERG, that is the committee chairman, after having his two predecessors killed, as well as tens of thousands of other suspected opponents, the new Marxist government undertook socialistic reforms, including nationalizations of the landlords and the church property, and they took them, and it was their property now. What do you think will happen if we have our country going down, and we have the government coming out with a government rule? Uh, I'll tell you what, they're saying now that's causing all these problems with the government and anything are Christians, you're, you're, you're the problem, because you're not supposed to speak up. You're not supposed to criticize our president. You're not supposed to criticize the Congress. You're supposed to act like dead people. That's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to say anything, and if you do, we don't like you. We don't like you at all. And uh, so that's very interesting. That's exactly what happens. So, we come down to the next one. That's Libya on page 139, if you want to look there. That's Libya is the next one. So far, we've got two. That's a line, Persia, and that. Now we come to Libya. Libya, if you didn't know this, in 1972, we had our Air Force in her country 
1972, Libya expelled our Air Force. Said, get out of our country. <laughs> We'd given them hundreds and millions and billions of dollars. And now they said, get out of our country. We don't want you here anymore. You can't have your air base here anymore. And they closed our air bases. One of the great Bible scholars and Bible teachers who had gone on to be with the Lord was Dr. Mark G. Cameron. And he had some interesting things to say concerning Libya in his book, While We Wait, on pages 43 and 44. Dr. Cameron was probably, in my opinion, one of the greatest Bible teachers I'd ever uh, mean, uh, had. In fact, when I went to Bible college, uh, he was teaching, and I told him when I went down there, I want, and I don't care what your schedule is, I want every class that this man teaches, because he was one of the greatest Bible teachers I ever heard. And uh, so they finally allowed me, said, well, you can't, you can't take uh, uh, hermeneutics, and you can't take Bible doctrines, there's too much there, and so forth. And uh, but what he didn't know was, before I went down, our pastor had had his books and stuff like that, so I'd ask him, I said, what are you going to teach me down there? He said, well, what do I need to know? And he said, well, you, you need the Bible doctrines, you've got you to know that, you've got to know the, uh, uh, all the doctrines of God, the theology and so forth, the soteriology and the harmatology and all of that, you've got to know that, <clears throat> all these doctrines. You got to know the Elohistic uh, uh, combinations and so forth, and uh, the Jehovahistic combinations, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Reba, Jehovah Sid Canoe, and you got to know what they mean and so forth like that. So I go down there and uh, I said, whatever the Dr. Cameron's teaching, then, well, well, we can't do that. I said, I'm paying for the courses. I don't care about the diploma of this or that. I could care less. I came here to learn the Bible. You got the greatest Bible teacher I've ever heard. And I want every course that he's taken. So I said, let me ask you a question. You're, you're saying I can't do it. Give me the Eloistic combinations. Well, well, it's been a while. I didn't know them. I said, well, didn't know them's in past tense. I know them now present tense. How about that? You know, what are you doing teaching here? You don't even know what they are. Give me the Jehovahistic combination. You want to know what the nine of them are? I'll give them to you. Jehovah Sikhanu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And so forth. Named them all off. I said, now you name it back to me. I just named it to you. Well, well, well I, I, I can't get them all. I said, you're telling me I can't take a course when I already know them because I'm not smart enough in order to do it. So to make a long story short, I took the courses. That was good. So I wanted to, if I'm going to pay for the courses, I want to learn everything this great Bible teacher has to teach. And I'll tell you what, he's a great Bible teacher. If you dropped your pencil, you're behind two weeks. I mean, he put her out, brother. I mean, he just put her out there like that. I'm not sitting there in awe. I was too, oh, man, alive. I can't get this. But anyway, let's go here because he was uh, preaching several years ago, 1979, and this is what's stated in his book there that he put this down because it happened to him. It was, uh, he was speaking at a Bible conference held in St. Petersburg, Florida, on this same subject. After the message, a dear brother in the Lord came up to me saying, this is Dr. Cameron, I want you to know that your message thrilled me. I saw in the paper where you were going to speak on this subject, and I just had to hear you, and he handed me a card. This is Dr. Cameron speaking now, what took place, showing that he was a United States Army Lieutenant Colonel retired chaplain corpse. He then added, I was in Libya as an officer when they kicked us out several years ago. I was in Turkey when they kicked us out of there. Our brass could not understand why these two countries, which had been, the, had been befriended by the United States with substantial financial aid, could do this. But I found the answer that the answer today while listening to your message, Dr. Cameron, it has been in the word all of the time that Libya and Turkey would be with Russia in the last days, and they are with her right now. That was back in 1979. Uh, 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 right in front of your face, they haven't changed. You see how things are coming up? And our time's gone. So, let me just say this. You can see in the picture here, and we put some, several pictures in, but we're going to stop here because our time's gone. But on April 16, 2008, Russian President uh, Vladimir Putin met with Libyan leader Omar Gaddafi in Tripoli. Well, Gaddafi's not with us anymore, but whoever they get, 
uh, is going to be with Russia, mark it down. So you can write stop there on your thing, all right? Write stop, stop on page 139, okay? Now, the next time when we pick this up, after the holidays here, I would like for you to bring this and we'll continue on and it'll give you a time to do a little study on it too and you will see the world situation as it is and you will thank God that you are a Christian because America has went down the tubes because our leaders are anti-Christian, they don't follow the Bible, they don't believe in the Bible and are making all kind of laws to appease the criminals and everything else and allow, I just still can't get over it, you allow a mother who goes out, commits adultery, and then wants to kill her child and you give her permission to commit first degree murder. You're the ones that ought to be tried for first degree murder, you bunch of misfits up there. And America should have marched on the Supreme Court and said, I'll tell you what, we need to get you men out of here. You are ruining America by standing up and allowing a woman to do that to her own baby. And in closing, let me just say this, if you don't know for sure you're going to heaven when you die, then the truth is you're probably not going, because if you knew you were going to heaven, then you would be fulfilling 1 John 5, 13, where Christ said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. So if you don't know you have eternal life, evidently you're believing the wrong thing. And you don't have the assurance that God gives in the Bible, but you're trusting some other dingbat out here, which I call them there, that's giving you his philosophy or her philosophy, which doesn't mean a thing. Going to heaven or hell, I want to know what the Bible says. And God said, I loved you. The billful represents sin. And with that sin, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there are two gifts. God gave his only begotten son who went to the cross and when I'll give you his payment for your sin so you don't have to go to hell and pay for your own. God said, please, I'm not willing, Max Jounce, that you should perish. Don't go to hell and pay for your sin when it's already paid for 2,000 years ago. And I put it in the Bible so churches can't get it all screwed up and twist it around and say you got to be willing to give up your sin and all that sort of thing. The first thing, you can give up all of your sin, but you're still a sinner and you'll still go to hell when you die. And you can quit your smoking, drinking, chewing, go to nasty girls that do. You can, you can quit doing all that kind of stuff. But you're going right straight to hell. So, by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, a gift to God, not of works, at least that the man should boast. Max Channels, please don't go to hell and pay for your sin. If you will accept my payment, this hand represents Christ, no sin. If you will accept my payment, believe that I died for you, I paid for your sins, please believe it. And if you do, I'll take your sin and mark it paid. 2,000 years ago at the cross, because that's the payment that keeps you from going to hell. And then I'll give you, Max Jones, my righteousness. So you go to heaven on my righteousness because you can never have it yourself because you fall short of the glory of God. In your humanity, all of sin falls short of the glory of God, which is his absolute righteousness, but I'll give you mine if you'll take my payment and be my son. As many as received him, to them gave he part, become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, then you can know for sure you're going to heaven when you die. And what a thrill that will be in this crazy mixed up world that is Satan's world. He is the God of this world, which has blinded the minds of them which believe not, least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. Don't you let him blind your mind, but you trust the Lord and know you have a home in heaven. We thank you for joining with us. Let's bow in a word of prayer. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, Father, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for the Bible that we don't ever have to be deceived by some person of humanity that has his own ideologies. We can turn to the Bible and thus saith the Lord, and we are on absolute truth, on the righteous, and we thank you for that. Bless each one here in Jesus' precious name. Amen.